How you doing? Welcome to Hope Christian Church. Let's sing. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Hope Christian Church. I'm glad you could join us here this morning on Independence Day. Woo! Happy Fourth of July, everyone. Be safe and sane. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the love that you pour out upon us every single day. Help us, Father, to open our hearts to your Spirit's promptings, to help us to channel the love that you fill us with to the people around us, to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that uh, helps others to see how desperately we need you and your Son in our lives. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of glory? Offers it to me. Who is this King of angels? Oh, blessed Prince of peace. Revealing things of heaven. And all its mysteries the spirits ever longing for his grace in which to stand who is this king of glory son of God and son of Amen. So pleased that you are here. I need to turn on my mic. All right. Well, uh, welcome to all of you that are here in the building celebrating uh, today uh, God's Word and God's truth. And for those of you who are online, watching faithfully out there, we welcome you as well. Let's have a prayer as we uh, begin the message today. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it's truth. 
We thank you that you have revealed so much truth to us. It's, it's almost more than we can comprehend, Lord, uh, because we know that you are, you are the truth and you are the life and you are the way. And so we just thank you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We have a guitar airplane going over here somehow, so thank you for that. Well, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a single fellow who, who loves God and you want to follow God's will for your life. And you're walking uh, out of work one day, and you're talking to God, and, and God draws your attention to a woman. She's standing on the street corner, and she's, uh, she's wearing sexually provocative clothing. You recognize her. You pass her nearly every night on your way from, from your office to your car. You've seen her in and out of men's cars uh, luring men with her sexual talk. You, you've seen her uh, walking into a sneezy light, a nightclub and, and then strolling out with some other man's arms on her nearly, nearly every time. You, you've pitied her. You've despised her. And you've turned your head away from her every time you see her so that you wouldn't look into her, to her uh, provocative eyes. You wonder... Why has God pointed out this woman to me? And then God says to you, as clear as a bell, this is the woman I want you to marry. And your jaw drops as the, the fantasies that you've had all your life of your own marriage vanish. Dreams of waiting in, in the church, at the front of the church for this beautiful young lady dressed in purity, white, gone. This woman doesn't even know the meaning of the word purity. She knows nothing about faithfulness or real love. She's full of lies and deceit. She sells her body for a few dollars or, or a gift of some sort. And you can't imagine spending the rest of your life wondering where your, whose bed your wife will end up next. But there's no mistake. This is God's word to you. You're to ha love a woman who has no idea of a committed marriage. She doesn't have any idea even of who she is. Her values are warped, and the word lost doesn't even get close to describing her. You've been given perhaps the biggest challenge of history to love with no expectation of love in return. Now, I know this sounds far out and, and impossible. It breaks all the rules that we tell young men and young women about searching for a godly spouse to spend the rest of their lives with. But this is no imaginary dream for one man. Hosea. That's Hosea, not Jose, by the way. Uh, he was the man who was facing this challenge. And his word from God was Mary a prostitute, and love her like I love you. Now, he must have been quite a man to follow God's voice here. And he went to a woman named Gomer. Not the nicest of names, not the nicest of women. And he proposed marriage to her. And at their wedding, when the singers sang, we've only just begun, white lace and promises, a kiss for luck and, you're on, and we're on our way, Everybody there, including Hosea, knew that he needed more than luck. And everyone in that wedding congregation was thinking, this is the craziest match that I've ever heard of. It will never last. Let's start reading the, the first chapter of the book of Hosea. If you have a, your Bible, you can follow along with me. I'm going to read various parts, and I'll refer to them over, over the period of this time. Hosea is the first of those little prophets that we talked about last week that we call the minor prophets. So chapter 1 of Hosea, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, the southern kingdom, and during the reign of Jeroboam, the son of Jehoash, the king of Israel. 
And so this puts the date about 760 to 700 B.C. Verse 2, when the Lord Yahweh began to speak through Hosea, the Lord Yahweh said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. Now there was a reason for God's seemingly crazy request. He was to uh, represent how God loved Israel this unfaithful people who God had married himself to. So verse 3 says, So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him the son. And then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at the town of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And in that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. So the first child that they have, he was was a son, and he was to be named Jezreel. Doesn't sound like a bad name. There There are a lot of J's around. But Jezreel was the place of killing. It was a place where King Jehu had killed Ahab, King Ahab of Israel, and he'd also killed Uh, King Ahaziah of Judah, he killed Queen Jezebel there, and he had the heads of Ahab's 70 sons actually brought to him in Jezreel. So the name Jezreel brought horror to the mind of people, in the same way that maybe the, the Tower of London does to the British, or it would be like naming somebody Auschwitz today. Even the worst parents wouldn't name a child Jezreel. But you know, God gave names to make a point. And Jezreel was a sign of judgment for for the rulers of the day. But just as Jehu, King Jehu, had annihilated the previous dynasty, so the dynasty, his dynasty, would also be completely destroyed. So Jezreel, that name signifies judgment. It signifies destruction, really. In verse 6, it says, Gomer conceived again and gave birth, this time to a daughter. And then the Lord, Yahweh, said to Hosea, Call her Lo-Ruhamah, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah. Remember those two divided countries? Israel, he says, I'm not going to show love to them anymore. And Judah, I will. And I will save them, not by bow, sword, or or bow, or by horses or horsemen, the biggest artillery that they could have, but by the Lord their God. Now, this odd couple then had a daughter, and they named her Lo-Ruhamah, which means no mercy, or not loved. I mean, God was saying that the time for mercy was up for them. The people are just taking advantage of his mercy. Now, God much prefers to give mercy, but if people are not receiving his mercy, then he has to give judgment. He has to bring judgment. So for now, it's no mercy, no love. And that's the little girl's name. And that's what God is going to do. And then verse 8, after she had weaned Lo-Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord Yahweh said, call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. So this second son named Lo-Ami means not my people. And God was telling them, you're not acting like my people anymore. And therefore, I can't act like I'm your father. I can't act like I'm your protector. Now, I've heard some pretty odd names in my life, haven't you? But these sort of take the cake. I mean, how would you like to be called not my people or not loved? Uh, I heard somebody recently actually named their child, and they were always in trouble and everything. They named their, their daughter Felony. And I thought... What a terrible name to name people. But 
one person, and I can imagine there are self-image problems in this, but as one person in our life group explained when we were reading this book, perhaps when they were old enough, then they could actually explain to the children who asked them, why were you named that? They could explain to them what God was doing and what his meaning were. Now, in the story, it's not clear again what, when this happened, but Gomer is up to her old tricks again, turning tricks. She's back at the oldest profession in the world. I mean, can you imagine the pain that that causes her husband? I, I don't know about you, but some of you maybe experienced your wife or your husband having an affair. It's, it's like a punch to the gut. It hurts deeply. Nothing hurts quite so much. It cuts at the very heart of your marriage. It's a breach of your marriage vows. And in our day, when sex is viewed so casually by so many, it's amazing how adultery still stings so painfully. And that's because sex is more than physical, even though that's what a lot of people says it is. But it wounds so severely that most marriages don't survive it. It hurts both the offended and the offender too. And after the compassionate love of Hosea, who's already pulled her off the streets, made her a decent wife, she sold herself. She sold herself into prostitution slavery. It sounds impossible, but the truth is it still happens today. Some of you may know Agape International Mission in Cambodia. Um, my wife and I visited their ministry a few years ago. And one of their purposes is to rescue and restore girls who've been trafficked, who've been sold into sexual slavery. Most of these girls are, are tricked into prostitution. You know, they tell them they have a great job for them in the city and their parents will do that. It will, or sometimes their parents even sell them. But in this ministry, girls are rescued. They gain hope. They, they can receive real love. And they begin, can begin to see real value in themselves. And in that ministry, they teach girls good skills like, like sewing and jewelry making so they can make enough money so that they don't have to go back onto the streets and most turn their lives around and make tremendous progress. Many of them get married and do, do great. But occasionally, a girl leaves the program, and later, they find the girl returning to her old profession. She's caught, perhaps, in a cycle of despair, perhaps thinking that's the only way she can support herself, or, or the, that's all she thinks that she's worth. Now the Lord speaks to Hosea again, and he asks him to do something most of us would think is impossible. He says, go love your wife again, go love a slut. Go love someone who's cut your heart out. Go forgive someone who keeps hurting you. Go show her that your love is stronger than your hurt, because God says, that's what my love is like. It's stronger than the hurt that people give him, that we give him. So in the next verse, it says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. That always sounds funny, the sacred raisin cakes, but, but I guess it's almost like uh, they're having communion with these other gods against the real God, Yahweh, the Lord. So Hosea's mission, should he accept it, is to go to his wife's pimp master and buy her back. I mean, would you do that? Or would you just say, forget it. I've tried over and over and you are hopeless, Gomer. I think I would wash that woman right out of my hair. I would tell her, hit the road, Gomer, and don't you come back no more, no more, no more. I wouldn't tolerate that kind of disrespect for marriage and, and for me. But Hosea has bigger love than I do. 
He's really the best example, I think, of love in the whole Bible, with the exception of Jesus. And Hosea accepts this mission that God has, just as God has accepted his mission to us. In chapter 3, verse 2, it says, So I bought her. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. That's about six ounces. Six ounces of silver at about $20 an ounce today. That's $120. And about a homer and a lethic of barley. That's about 10 bushels. So at $6 a bushel, that, that's about $60. So he pays a good sum for her, for sure. That's almost $200. And that's the going rate in Cambodia now for a young girl. I can imagine Hosea's friends are watching and they're laughing. Um, Haven't you had enough disrespect for this woman, they would say? I mean, we warned you the first time not to marry her. She's bad news. She's not worth the trouble. Have you taken a stupid pill or something? But Hosea does what God says, not what people say. And because God's word is always more powerful than people's insults. And Hosea wants to make a decent woman out of her. And he does everything he can to do it. Amazing love. How can it be? And Hosea's life, his life becomes a picture of the message of God. Real life form. And his life is a parable, really, of the love of God for people who are unfaithful to him. And that's why I admire Hosea so much. He's chosen by God to tell God's love story. Uh, The Bible doesn't tell us much about Hosea's feelings, but I can imagine he had a lot of conflicting feelings about this. I mean, how do I love a person like that, so far off the scale of knowing how to love, always unfaithful? Can you imagine the agonizing nights that he had watching the clock and and wondering where she is, worrying every time she goes out the door? Maybe he's thinking, Gomer, don't take your love to town. Gomer wants Hosea to understand. I mean, God wants Hosea to understand that this is the conflict that God himself faces with his people. God knows that his own people's sin is so heinous that they observe that they deserve to be completely written off forever and yet and yet God still loves them and God still loves you and God still loves me even when we're unfaithful to him Now let's shift gears a a little bit and do a little background on the prophet and his book. Hosea is the only one of the the writing prophets who comes from the northern kingdom, Israel. And and his prophecy is mainly directed to that same wicked kingdom. His ministry lasts about 38 years and about the same time span as Isaiah, you know, one of those major prophets, the big ones, Micah and Amos. Uh, He lived in the final tragic days of of the northern kingdom, during which six kings reigned. Four of them were actually assassinated by their successors, and so they had very short reigns indeed. It was really an evil, bloody time. It it was a time when when, uh, God was trying to draw them back to him. They were worshiping other idols. They were worshiping other gods, just picking up gods from all the people around them. Now, this book has two main sections. The first section is more of the story, which I've just told you, the story of, of, of Homer. Of, of, sorry, I put those words together. Hosea and Gomer uh, together. And it tells uh, where God tells Hosea what to do, and and Hosea is to learn about the character of God. And that's the part we've been reading. But the rest of the book deals with the message, the strong message, really, that that God gives Hosea for Israel, the northern kingdom. So we read in chapter 1, verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea. 
So first God speaks to the prophet, and then God speaks through the prophet. And that's the way he works with most people, I think. God teaches us a lesson, and then we put it into our lives, and then we can actually teach it to other people. Because usually you can't teach anything that you haven't learned well yourself. And I can imagine that after Hosea had been married to Gomer for a while, he thought, now, now I understand. Now I understand how God feels about what the people have done when they've turned away from him. Now I understand how much God loves. And often I think that's true in life, that it takes an experience, usually a a difficult one, to teach the lessons that somebody has been trying to tell you for years. Now, if you've read that book of Hosea recently, and I always encourage uh, you to do that, you probably noticed that after the first three chapters, Hosea goes back and forth between those two big themes that we talked about last week. Justice on one hand, and mercy on the other hand. Two sides of the same coin with God. Two sides of of what we all have to have in our lives. And Hosea uses that imagery to make points. He uses strong imagery, particularly on the area of justice. He said, God will judge them like maggots and pus in a wound. Hosea shocks the audience with his words. He wants to jar them loose from their careless thoughts and their their actions against God. And just like we talked about last week with, with Jonah, God wants to reveal his mercy, especially to this, this special group of people that he's married themselves to, that he's married himself to. But he also must stand for justice in the world. And that's what we want too, don't we? We want justice for sure, especially for ourselves. But we also need mercy. We need mercy from other people when we do something that hurts them. And we need mercy, especially from God. So the big question that Hosea calls us to ask today, does God love a slut? The answer is, of course, yes. He loves people like us. He loves people like me. People who act like they're committed to to God, but sometimes take our love elsewhere. Let me mention uh, about six points that I want to make fairly quickly today. Important lessons we learn from Hosea about how God regards his people. First, what we've already seen. Your relationship to God is like marriage. In chapter 2, verse 19, he says, I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in a lifelong committed relationship with God, like marriage. And of course, God always says his I do first. And then we say our I do as well. God always initiates the relationship. But we must make the commitment as well. And the relationship requires all the things that are necessary in marriage. Commitment, faithfulness, open communication, honesty, integrity, repentance. Yeah, repentance we have to do in marriage too and willingness to forgive often because we often sin in each other against each other in marriage and we must grow and there's a whole lot more of things too the second point i want to make is that if our marriage to god is like marriage then persistent sin is like prostitution I mean, how do you feel when God compares sin to prostitution? I I mean, I don't like it very much, really. But it's that relationship that's broken. Now, God has made a covenant relationship with Israel, but Israel doesn't keep her part of the relationship. It wasn't that Israel didn't like God, Yahweh, the Lord, God, the real God. They just thought, well, we can have other gods too. They thought God wasn't enough. 
And many people think that their relationship with God isn't enough either. Christians don't think that their relationship with God is ex exclusive. Sure, I like to follow Jesus, um, but that's just a little part of my life. I mean, why should God be so ups upset if I devote myself to other things too? I still believe in God. And so we can't really imagine that God would call it our sins, our breaking faith with him, adultery or prostitution. It describes ordinary people like, like me and like you. If you've ever had a marriage partner be unfaithful to you, and I hope you haven't, if you've ever had someone betray your love or a child who rejects you, you understand a little bit about God's view because God is in deep agony when you reject his love. And the breaking of the marriage bond causes pain and agony all around, even in the ones who initiate it. And God feels that harm that sin causes. There's fallout all around when you break faith with God. Your family is harmed, the church is harmed, you are harmed, and even God is harmed. Sin is not just a minor, insignificant slip that has no consequences. And sometimes Christians think that they can just live however they want with minimal commitments, with minimal consequences. They think they can have a little bit of God's values and a little bit of something else on the side. But we have to call it what it is. It's unfaithfulness to the God who's always faithful to us, who loves us. And God feels this particularly when his leaders reject his love. In chapter 4, verse 7, it said, The more the priests increase, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. And it will, it will be like people, like priests. And I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Those of us who are leaders of any kind, especially in the church, have a great responsibility. And when we just follow the cultural patterns of the world around us, we lead our people astray and, and God is betrayed. All of us who lead in any way are called to high standards. We also learn, and this is my third point, that God loves you enough to strip you bare to help you realize how lost you may be. It may feel not... It may not feel like love to you, but it is. It's tough love. In chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, he says, Let her, Israel, remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. In Genesis, do you remember? When people first sinned, then they realized they were naked. God had to strip them bare in order to help them realize the seriousness of where they are. And when God, people live in open rebellion to God, God may strip them bare to show them the seriousness of their sin. God cares about you enough to do something radical in your life. If that's the only way that he can get the message through to you. But the fourth point I want to make is that the wonderful news is that God still has compa is compassionate despite our ingratitude at times. Way back in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. Remember the exodus? But the more I called Israel, the further they went away. Do you remember when you had children and you'd call them when they were really little and they'd, they'd go further and further away rather than coming near you? That's what God's saying about. They sacrificed to the Baals, the, the other gods. They burned incense to images. It was I who taught Israel to walk taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. 
I, God, led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. With people that far from God, as Israel was that day, you might expect that God would just do a Sodom and Gomorrah on them and just destroy them forever. But God does not. He's compassionate again and again and again. God doesn't overlook sin, but he still loves us even in our sin. And some of us perhaps can attest to how when you were far from God, God brought you to him. Maybe you rejected him in some way or the other, and you knew it, but you kept walking far from him. The fifth point is, of course, that God desires for you to return to him. He does. He wants us. At the very end of Hosea, chapter 14, he says, Return, O Israel, to Yahweh the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you. Take words with you and return to Yahweh. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. God wants to hear your words. He does. When you return, you have to speak to God and tell him. Tell him where you are but not empty words. Repentance needs words. It needs words to express it. But actions must follow words. Words without action are, of course, meaningless. You've you've heard people say, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that. But unless they really do it, what does that mean? Your repentance must produce genuine changes in your life. But Hosea... He didn't forgive Gomer from a distance. First, he bought her back, and then he brought her back to his own home. And every time he saw her, I wonder if it, if it pained him. He brought his hurt home with him. But Hosea's desire to love and forgive was greater than his hurt. And God feels the pain too, but God's love for you and for me is greater than his hurt. He promises in that last chapter, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. Verse 4 of chapter 14. For my anger has turned away from them. Now the truth is, I don't know much about prostitutes or prostitution. There are probably a lot of reasons somebody ends up there. Many are trafficked. They're forced against their will like like the little girls that we saw in Cambodia. Some may feel so desperate that they don't know any other way to survive. And I imagine many of them have never had the love of a father or a husband or even a brother. There are a lot of women and men starved for real love and looking for love in all the wrong places. But in the midst of that, you need to know that God's love for you is what you've always wanted. It's what you've always dreamed of. It's it's what you've always longed for. And it's the only thing that will fill your soul. And all those other distractions, all those deep desires that you have, all the ways that you try to fulfill those desires, even our own human love is just a glimpse of the reality of God's deep love, his deep, deep love. God hates what Israel is doing, but he loves his people. Early in Hosea, God promises, I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those people who, called, who I called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. Hosea seems to me like a a one-in-a-million man. Hosea loves someone who's far from lovely, a long way from lovable, and, and stayed committed to that relationship in spite of her great unfaithfulness to him. You think your spouse is frustrating? Gomer must have been the most frustrating of wives, the most high maintenance of spouses. 
to love her was to give up nearly everything, every dream, every, every hope, every happiness. I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. But I want to have that Hosea, that, that God type of love for, for my family, for my Christian family in the world. You may need to love someone in your family who drives you crazy. You may be called to love a prodigal son. You may be called to love a wayward daughter who's, who's so far away from God and, and even You may need to love a sworn enemy. And I want to do that. I want to grow in love. I, I want to be so loving that I, that I go beyond my own need for love in return. But Hosea's story is more than loving your wife or your husband or even your neighbor. It's about a God who loves you so deeply, even when you're way off messing around with all those distractions. And I think if there ever was someone in this story we should identify with, it's probably not Hosea. It's Gomer. We're often the Gomer that, that God keeps loving and loving and loving. And this kind of love, of course, is fully seen in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. Not when we were good, not when we did everything right, not when we were faithful. But that's when God loved us. And that's God's love for you. I wonder today how Gomer felt when she was on that auction block again. Head low, wondering who would buy her this time. A mean master who would use and abuse her. A sex slave was all she was good for, she probably thinks. And yet in the back of her mind, she's still wondering how she could walk away from the only man who ever really loved her. And, she, and as she heard those cat calls and, and the bids for her body, perhaps she recognized one bidding voice. And she raised her eyes just enough to see a familiar face, the, the kind face that, that relentlessly pursued her. And as the gavel falls and the auctioneer points to the most unexpected buyer in the room, her shame must be over the top. She knows what she's done, where she's been, how she's hurt this man over and over and over. And after the man, after the money is handed, handed over and she is handed over to Hosea, perhaps she cowers, expecting that he's going to give her a tongue lashing or, or, or a beating. She knows she deserves it. Instead, the man wraps his arms around her and lifts her chin to look him in the eyes. She's loved with overwhelming love, the kind of love that takes away shame and puts her on the right path. That same kind of love that puts us on the same path again. Now Hosea's book doesn't tell us what happens after that. We don't know if she is so grateful and received of love over and over, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've turned away, no matter how many times you've thumbed your nose at him, no matter how many times you've walked the other way. God is the relentless lover of your soul, and he comes to get you. He buys you back, and he wants to return you to your first real love. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for this fellow that you gave this really challenging message to, Hosea. And especially, I thank you for what he showed us about you. 
about how your love is so strong. And Lord, I pray for all of us today that are here and those who are, are listening and watching online. I pray that uh, if you're calling us to repentance now, we would do that. If you're calling us to receive your overpowering love, as I know you are, I pray that we would do that. And I pray that your love would reach, would reach the parts that nothing else in our lives have done. I thank you, Lord, for that love. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Sure. You know, it's always a blessing to come to the Lord's table. I hope all of you have some elements available to you, those of you who are at home as well as those who are here. Um, it, it's always a blessing to come to the Lord's table every week because it prompts us to ask for something we need. 
God's forgiveness. We realize that the great thing that Jesus has done by dying for us, uh, for our sins, and we're asked to examine ourselves. We're asked to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, and we actually receive forgiveness. That's the joy of it. Now, C.S. Lewis prompted me to, to think a little deeper about asking for God's forgiveness, because sometimes it seems that we're not really asking for forgiveness, but we're asking for God to excuse us. The response we want from God is really, I understand that you couldn't really help it, or, or you didn't really mean it. You weren't really to blame in this particular thing. Now, of course, if you weren't to blame, then there's nothing to forgive. And I think that sometimes when I ask for forgiveness, I'm really asking God to excuse me for some extenuating situation. You know, if she hadn't said that, or if he hadn't done that, then, then I wouldn't have done my wrong thing. And you understand that, God, right? I wonder if you do that too. <clears throat> Lewis writes that in real forgiveness, God says, yes, you have done this thing or not done this thing, and I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly as it was before. The consequences of what you have done have been erased. So instead of asking God to excuse us if we've truly committed sin, we need to straightforwardly admit that we have sinned. It wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't something that someone else could be blamed for. It was something that hurt someone definitely hurt God, and it probably hurt you, and it most certainly did damage to your relationship with God. So God doesn't overlook our sin. Oh, it was nothing. Like we sometimes say when somebody says, excuse me, oh, it was nothing. It wasn't nothing. It was something, because God can't forgive nothing. God forgives sin. And he takes the hurt of sin on himself and he, sa and he says, I'm going to let you go. You're free from the ultimate consequences. You are forgiven. So let's take just a few moments of silence then just, just to confess our sins to God so that we're ready to take communion together. And now we're ready to participate in the Lord's Supper where the body and blood of Jesus are represented in this tiny piece of unleavened bread and this tiny, tiniest cup in the world of, of juice. So let's give thanks for the bread. Lord, I thank you for this bread. I thank you that you have given us this reminder of what you've done for us that you've given us life through this. We thank you, Lord, for your broken body on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus didn't merely explain it. He said, this is my, my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And let's give thanks for the juice. Lord, we thank you for this, this juice that reconnects us again every week with the life that you've given us. Your life was, was given. Your blood was shed on our behalf. And we're grateful because we need the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of Jesus.
sacred King. Oh, holy King, how can I honor you rightly? Honor that's fit for your name. Oh, sacred friend, Father, we thank you so much that you take us as we are. 
And when we accept the sacrifice of your son on the cross, accept him as our Savior and Lord, we are wiped clean of our sin. And Father, we're thankful that you knew and you know how we are, how, how easily we turn aside. And so you provided a way for us to be reconciled with you again through repentance. As we ask, Father, for your forgiveness and turn from our sin, you remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Help us, Father, to press into your heart every day, to examine ourselves to see where we maybe are drifting or turning away from you, and help us, Father, to turn back and to ask for your forgiveness. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> So our God is a mighty God, and he's, he's a great reason to rejoice. So let's, I uh, haven't done this in a long time. I invite everyone to stand. You don't have to, but I invite everyone to stand as we sing this last song this morning.
Amen. Well, thank you all for being with us this morning, whether you're here in person or at home watching on live stream. I just want to encourage you to, to remember how much God loves you, how much he wants to have a deep personal relationship with you, each and every one of you. Me too. Amazing. I know who I am. I know what I'm like. And yet God loves me. He sent his son to pay the price for my sin so I could have a relationship with him. And that's the same thing for you as well. I pray that we will examine our hearts, examine our lives, and see those things where we are, are turning away from our Father and turn around, ask him for forgiveness, and then live out that forgiveness, that change, turn from our sin. That's not easy. It is not. But Nothing is impossible with God. He can do so much more than we can ever imagine. So thank you for joining us. Just a quick reminder, we have uh, uh, Monday night Bible studies. I, I'm not sure if those, are, if those are happening this week or not. I, I'm getting a high sign that they are, so that's good. Uh, so please, if, you, if you're interested, we have a men's and women's Bible studies Monday night. The information on how to join that is on our website at hopesearch.org. And uh, if you have an offering that you'd like to send to us, please, you can mail it to the church at 1975 Pollard Road, Los Gatos, 95032. Or uh, you can use Zelle or come by and drop it off any way you like. Thank you so much for all the support that uh, you have shown the church through this uh, last year and a half. And I just pray that uh, as we return to quote-unquote normal, that we'll be able to have more time and fellowship together and really uh, just be that close-knit family that, that we are. And uh, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Remember, Jesus loves you, and so do we.